I'm glad to be here to help us approach, I think, a very beautiful book, with a very beautiful concept. Sometimes things like Job and the Psalms and Proverbs that are written in Old Testament or in Hebrew poetry style, we don't go to as often because, you know, it doesn't seem like it's going to have a lot of doctrine since it's written in a poetic form and in uh, poetic style. The book of Job is a difficult book for some people and all of us at times because of its nature, because of its poetic nature, and more than that, because it's a drama. And a lot of times we're trying to get something out of every verse. You know, if you go to a play and you try to get something out of every line in the play, you're going to be in trouble because that was not what was intended to be portrayed. You go see Hello, Dolly, don't examine every word in the dictionary to find out what it means. I mean, that's not the intent of the writer. This is a uh, really a thing that can be acted out in several acts as if it were a play. So it's difficult for that reason, because we're used to studying the Bible to try to get something out of every verse or at least out of every chapter. And we also don't like for things to be repetitious. And the book of Job is repetitious. Now, we're not going to study the book chapter by chapter. We're going to, tonight, just try to get the story in front of us, just get the whole thing in one setting. Tomorrow night, we'll look back over it bit by bit and try to analyze it again more in a bird's eye view. And then we'll get down for the last three nights and walk along bit by bit with Job through several of his concepts. We'll look at his concept of God. We'll look at his concept of suffering. We'll look at his concept of himself, of life, of righteousness, of reward. We'll begin to see into what man can see without a revelation from God. Because when God appears on the scene, guess what he asks you? Remember the question he asked if you've read Job before? When God finally talks, and that's what everybody has wanted to happen so far, when God finally talks, God said, Who is this that talks without understanding, that darkeneth words without counsel? And Job, if he were honest, will say, Here, present, I'm the one. Because Job speaks according to his own wisdom. Every word in this book is recorded by inspiration. Very little of it is right. Nearly everything in the book of Job is wrong. I mean, that's what God said. Here's a book of the twisted reflection of a tortured man and the more twisted reflections of people who want to persecute a tortured man. But so why then is it in the Bible? It is in the Bible for this very basic reason, to let us know that we can trust God when we can't understand him and that he trusts us even when we're not trustworthy. And you know, both of those lessons are very essential lessons to learn. When everything goes wrong, can I still trust God? When I don't understand a single thing that's going on, can I still trust God? And I, am I able to rely on God to fulfill His will in my life in spite of the fact that I don't understand where He is, who He is, what He is, or what He is doing? Just how ignorant can I be and God still help me? See, that's one of the questions. I think that's the main question the book of Job says. Ignorance or knowledge is not the criterion by which God is going to work with man, so what is it? And I think the book of Job was written to answer that question. It asks a question it never answers. Matter of fact, I think it's an unanswerable question. And that is, why do the righteous suffer? Now, we, we kind of put some of that as, as kind of as curiosity uh, perkers, you know, to maybe in the newspaper and our fly, our leaflet or somebody, our, our flyer to get somebody to come, thinking he's going to answer the question, why do the righteous suffer? You're going to be terribly disappointed. I don't think that question is answered anywhere in the Bible. It's really not an important question if you understand what's in the book of Job. Do you sometimes wake up realizing that you've been asking the wrong questions? You know, I do that quite often. A lot of times I'm asking for the answers to questions that even if I had them, it wouldn't help me in the struggle I'm trying to overcome. I just want the strength to go on if I never get any of my questions answered. And that's what the book of Job is going to do. It's going to say you have the ability and the right to go on. And even if you don't think you do, that's all right. God will carry you along anyway if you love him. Why 
do the righteous suffer? Can God be trusted? I think I get an answer to that question without getting the answer to the question. Without the question being answered, I get an answer to this question. Can I trust God in the midst of all of my difficulties and, and, and misunderstandings? The book of Job is a very ancient book. I'm hurrying through a quick introduction because I don't have to do this over and over again. The book of Job is a very ancient book, probably the, in history as ancient as Abraham or maybe even before. He will live 140 years after his trials. He is an elder during his trials. And so it would make him about 60 or 70 years old in Israel's economy if you're going to live 140 years after, you know, you become an elder. And so he probably lived about 210 years. That's exactly, 205 years, if I remember correctly, was Terah's age, Abraham's father, when he died. And Abraham died 175, and, and Jacob died, what, about 148, wasn't it? Or no, 100, Abraham 175, Jacob 180. Uh, Isaac 180, Jacob 148, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so there is a plateau there in the 200s, and that's where Job will fit. So Job is pre-Abraham. He lived before there was any kind of idolatry except the kissing of one's hand toward the sun. Because when they are accusing Job of every sin in the book, from stealing from widows to stepping on baby chickens, the only thing religiously, according to idolatry, that they can accuse Job of is that he kissed the back of his hand toward the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's a secret worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. He uh, lived and died before God began to have men write. You know, there was no need for a written record in those days because one man stood between knowing them Two men stood between them and knowing the story of creation and the story of the fall. Adam lived into the life of Methuselah. Methuselah died the year of the flood. Shem died 12 years after Jacob was born. So all you really need was Methuselah and Jacob and, by the I mean, Shem. And Shem had 205 years to learn from Methuselah. And so that, all you needed was Methuselah to tell them the story he'd learned from Adam, and Shem passed it on to everybody all the way through Jacob. So you didn't need a written revelation, just like today if your grandmother's still alive, you don't need to have a written re re revelation of the Depression. She remembers everything about the Depression, and she can tell you everything about that period of time. So really we don't need any history written yet about the Depression because I'm looking at enough white hairs that remember the Depression. I know we do because every time we start doing something great and going to require a lot of money, we're still talking about, well, we got to continue to save for coming Depression. Boy, you didn't live through the Depression. So I know we don't need a written re revelation about the Depression. So Job lived in a time that you could get ear witness from an eye witness of the flood who had had the ear witness from an eye witness of creation. And so there was no need for written records. So I don't really know when the book of Job was written. The period of time was pre-literary, before God ever started having man write down his word. Job lived and Job died. Let's get into the book, all right? There was a man who lived in the land of Uz. His name was Job. Doesn't that start out sort of like, you know, Shakespeare, Mother Goose, or, or that kind of thing? Once upon a time, once upon a time, doesn't tell you when, doesn't matter when, does not matter when, but at some period of time, sometime in the past, in the land of us, wherever that is, not us, us, in the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. He was a perfect and upright man. He feared God and he turned away from evil. He was a morally correct man, perfect and upright. He was a religiously devout man. He feared God and turned away from evil. He was materially prosperous. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 she-asses, 500 yoke of oxen, and a great household, so that he was the greatest man in the East. Now, the East has always been the richest part of the world. And greatest means richest. So he was the richest man in the richest part of the world. He was the richest man alive. Nobody possessed more goods than Job did. He was the richest man in the world. 7,000 sheep, 
uh, in anybody's age is a lot of money. In that age, a ton of money. This fella, you know, I, uh, if I had time, I've got memorized, if I could get out of the computer bank, a modern parallel to him. It'd be a fella with something like, you know, 30,000 head of prime Hereford and, you know, whatever else. Whatever else would go with the richest rancher in all the world. Here is the richest man in the richest part of all the world, morally correct, religiously right, materially prosperous, domestically happy. He had seven sons and three daughters. In the book of Psalms 127, about verse 3 to 5 or somewhere in that context, David says happy uh, th that a man's sons are his inheritance from the Lord, and blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And Job's quiver was full. He had seven sons and three daughters. They loved each other so much that on every one of them's birthday, the fellow whose birthday it was gave a party for everybody else. Now, that's just the opposite of the way we do it today. On a fellow's birthday, we give a party for him. But every time one of Job's sons had a birthday, he gave a party for every one of the other six sons and the three daughters, and they had a good old time. And Job was so religiously meticulous that he was worried that maybe in their joy they might have said something they ought not to have said. So at the end of the day, when they'd finished their feast, Job offered a sacrifice to God for them because he says maybe they've cursed God in their heart without realizing it. Maybe they've said something about God they ought not to have said. So the man is an unusual man. The scene shifts from earth down here where Job is all this rich to heaven. And it comes to pass on a day that the sons of God, that's angels, come to present themselves before God, the devil comes too. He'd rather not be there. You can bet on that. It proves he's a servant of God. Did you understand the devil's a servant of God? Now he's an unwilling servant. He's a disobedient servant. He's still a steward. He's still a servant of God. And every servant must occasionally do what? Make a report to the boss. He must make a report to the master. So when the sons of God come to talk about their service on earth on behalf of God, here comes the devil too. He doesn't want to say anything. You know how I know he doesn't want to say anything? God asked him a question. Where have you been? Now he's not asking for information. He is not asking for information, for the eyes of Jehovah are every place, keeping watch upon the evil and the good, the 28th chapter of Proverbs says. So God doesn't ask for information. He's omniscient. He already knows. He says, Satan, where have you been? He said, make your report. Tell me about your service for me. And he boasts of a great territory. He said, I've been walking to up and down in the earth and going to and fro in it. And then God said, you had not looked at Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Now watch God's estimate of Job. Have you considered my servant Job a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and turns away from evil? I have no one like him. He says 18. I mean, here's God's A team. Doesn't send him against the B team. The devil's about to get in a, in a struggle with God. And God doesn't send the scrubs out. He doesn't send the second team out to fight against the devil. It's his number one man. Here's his main man. Job is God's main man. He said, I have no other man like this man. He's perfect, upright, fears God, turns away from evil. And God, and Job, and the devil says, he doesn't serve you for nothing. He said, look what you paid him. You give me 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoga of 500 she has it. Make me the richest man in all the world. I might serve you too. Of course he's serving you. You've paid him. Said, you've built a fence about him so that I can't touch it. Has he, is he right so far? Is the devil right so far? He's right so far. You know, the clock doesn't run. He's right twice every day. And so the devil is right. He's correct. God has rewarded him. God has built a fence about him, but not for the reason the devil thinks. Why has God built a fence around Job and not let the devil touch him? So that this day can take it down and let the devil touch him. It would have been no struggle if the devil had been able to afflict Job all along. God made Job underprivileged by not being afflicted all these years. 
You know what the Bible says? What are we to, what are we to count pure joy, prosperity, or trouble? Now, prosperity is all right. It's got some joy in it. But you know what ought to be counted pure joy? James says, count it pure joy, my brethren, when you fall into manifold troubles. Now, how many of us have obeyed that passage this week? I mean, that's a difficult one to obey today. I mean, that one's not too easy to obey. Count it pure joy. So God has sort of underprivileged Job these 70 years by not letting him have the kind of trouble that other people have. But God's going to make up for that now because he's going to give him a special dose of trouble, more than other kind of folk have had to have, because he needs to catch up, doesn't he? Since he's been underprivileged and God has not been blessing him with a lot of trouble, now Job ought to have an extra dose of it. If God is a just God, he's going to let Job catch up with the rest by really making him have a lot of trouble. Well, Satan says, let me touch him. Just let me touch him. said, if I touch his flesh, he will announce you to your face. God said, accepted. And they struck hands on a bargain, and they agreed that that's exactly what would happen, that Job would be afflicted to prove that God was righteous. Because that's what Satan accused Job of. I mean, God of, excuse me. He says, you're unrighteous because you built a hedge around Job. He accused Job of being a hireling. He's serving for the pay. Take away the pay, and he'll quit rendering the service with a chuckle. Oh, your Bible, nor mine, will say with a chuckle. But I know the devil fairly well. I used to be friends with him. And he laughs on occasions like this. The devil chuckled. And he left heaven knowing he's about to show God the kind of stupid men he trusts. And so he goes. Job's sitting there one day. And a messenger comes up. I may not have these in the just exactly the right order, but it doesn't matter. Messenger comes up and says, you're 3,000 camels, and all the servants, 10 of them got killed, and I'm the only one escaped, and I've just escaped to come tell you. Now, while he's still talking, another one stands in line and says, you 7,000 sheep got killed, and everybody else got killed, and I'm only escaped to tell you. And while he's still talking, another one says, you 500 yoke of oxen, you 500 she asses got killed by a wind from the desert. God killed them, and I'm only one, the only servant left alive, and I've just come to tell you. And while he's still speaking, another one says, uh, your, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking in the eldest brother's house, and the wind from God blew and knocked down the house, and the seven boys and the three girls are dead, and all the servants taking care of them are dead, and I'm the only one, I'm the only one left, and I've just come to tell you. Bam, 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 that quick. I've never known a person lose all that quick. What would you do? If all is gone except four servants, you're the richest man in the world, now you've got four servants and a wife. And the only reason the servants didn't die was Job needed to hear it bang, 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 bang. The only reason the woman didn't die is the devil can use her to say what he would say were he there. And I'm not mad at the lady. She's a good lady, and she intends good. She just doesn't do very good. She comes in the next scene to curse Job in a way that this won't curse Job. Now, what happened? What can a man of God do if in one day loses everything? I mean, he loses all of his camels and all of his sheep and all of his asses and all of his, all of his oxen and uh, his household except for four servants. He's still got his land and his woman. And that's all he got. What can he do? Well, he can fall flat of his face on the ground. He can rip his clothes off. He can shave his head. He does that because he's about to heap ashes on. And ashes have acid in it, and if you don't shave your head, you lose your hair. Jack and I didn't know that when we were putting, putting ashes on our head, and that's why we're going bald. But anyway, he shaved, he shaved his head, heaped ashes on his head, and fell on his face and worshipped God. Boy, I can understand everything till then. I can understand tearing off the clothes, that's an expression of sorrow. Shaving the head, expression of sorrow. Heaping dust and ashes, expression of sorrow. Falling on the face, expression of sorrow. Worshiped God. That's what the man or the woman of God can do when in one day, in one moment of the day, they've lost it all. They can worship God. And say, so I came out from the womb naked. I'm going to return to the womb naked. I came naked. I'm going naked. It all belonged to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job realized nothing he had with his anyway, and if God wants his stuff back, that's God's business. A friend of mine told me just the other day on the phone that God had held out his corn. And if God wanted to hail out his own corn, he figured he had some reason to do that. He'd just go out there and plant again, see if it had time to get up again. 
And if the Lord wanted to hail out his corn again, I guess that's a large business. Large seed, large corn, large hail. Now, when we understand that, we understand how Job can do what he did. We get in trouble and we start twisting unholy hands in unholy despair rather than lifting hands in holy prayer. And that's really where, the, where Job is doing it, right? He's not, oh me, oh my, I'm, I'm such a righteous man. Why did this happen to me? How can a righteous God bring this much punishment on me? Have you ever done that? I've done that. I'll confess. I mean, I've done that. I've made that response to God's blessings. Job just said, Blessed be the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It belonged to him. Evidently, he needed it somehow, and so it's gone. But blessed be the name of God. Scene shifts back to heaven. It came to pass on the day the sons of God came to present themselves before God. The devil came, and God said, Where have you been? And if God laughs, and I think he does, because I'm his friend now, run the devils, and I believe I've heard God chuckle. I believe God said, Satan, where, where have you been? Because, see, Satan doesn't want to say a word because he's already got one sound whipping, right? And that's the way I am. When I lose, I'd rather be quiet. And so the devil just sitting there, you know, or standing there, and God said, where have you been? He said, been going up and down the earth, walking to and fro in it. And God said, have you considered my servant Job a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and turns away from evil? And he still holds fast his integrity, though thou hast moved me against him to destroy him without a cause. In that second chapter, who takes credit for everything that's happened to Job? God does. And God says he's what? For Job or against him right now? Against him. Says you have moved me, God, against Job to destroy him without any cause on his part. Boy, he really does trust Job, doesn't he? Ooh, I'd like to be that kind of a man. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of man or woman? That God could just tell the devil, I tell you, I'll prove I'm God. You just go give Larry all that you want to give Larry. He'll stand, no problem. Just go hit Rhonda hard as you want to hit her. She'll stand. I mean, that's the way God knows Job. Does Satan give up? I don't like him much, but there's one good thing I know about him. He is no quitter. And so he says, you haven't touched him yet, skin for skin. All that a man has will he give for his life. All right, he's in your hand. He's in your hand. Do to him anything you want to do to him. Only spare his life. That's one time God's not merciful. Horse breaks his leg, what do you do? Well, at least used to, what do you do? Shoot him. Put him out of his misery. God's not going to be merciful to Job because something eternally significant for all the world is at stake. And so mercy is put aside and Job has to endure the totality of the wrath of God. It been, what does he want to do? Well, let's go on and see. Satan again laughs and goes from the presence of God, and he gives Job leprosy. I know he does because Bildad calls it the firstborn of death. And that's what leprosy is called still today in that part of the world. Death's oldest son. Death's chief servant. The firstborn of death. Leprosy itself. He gets from the bottom of top of his head to the bottom of his feet. I always ask this question at this point. How many of you have seen a leper? One, two, three, four, four, nobody on this side. Four people are already sick at their stomach with the word leper. Right, Martin? I mean, when you really, right, Priscilla? I mean, when you see a leper, only time I've ever seen Priscilla's father, Parker Henderson, frightened was when he woke up the next morning and was told he'd slept in a bed a leper had slept in the night before. The only time I've ever seen Parker Henderson frightened in all of my life because he'd slept in the bed with a le that a leper had slept in the night before. Leprosy is the most hideous disease there is to the eye and to the nose. And Job has it for months. Chapter 7, verse 5, Job says, Months of misery have I. He doesn't have leprosy for a little while. He says, maggots eat his flesh. It falls from his, his flesh falls off and his bones are exposed and worms and maggots crawl around inside of his flesh. He scrapes his, himself with a piece of pottery, just trying to get all that dead stuff off of him that smells so foul. Well, he's gone from the fellow when he entered the place of judgment. The old men stood up and the young men left. 
And when he spoke, nobody else talked because Job spoke wisdom. And now he is rejected by the community. He's outside the city on the dung heap, on the ash heap. There's where the leper goes. Remember in the Old, remember in the New Testament, the leper, you know, was not supposed to be touched by others. Matter of fact, he was obligated to put his hand over his mouth or a little bit out from his mouth so that the germs would hit his hand. wasn't spread by germs anyway, but they thought it was. You know, put put his hand out from his mouth and cry, unclean, 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 and everybody would leave. Everybody would move out, and that's what Job has done. From a fellow from a fellow who was the most respected man in the community, he's become an outcast, a reject. He says, young men whose fathers were not even worthy to take care of my dogs have me in derision. I mean, the young bucks of the community are coming by and laughing at him. Yeah, there's the old boy that told us how to live. He's an ungodly sinner. Look at him on this ice heap. Months. Months he's out there. When he finally gets to talking, he's going to tell you that his concept of God is that he always rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked right now. So what does his theology tell him about himself? That he's a bad, bad sinner. But he searches his heart. What does it tell him about? Ain't no sin there. That explains this. Now what's he going to listen to? His Bible, his theology, or his heart? Well, with those two dilemmas, I don't really want to tell you what I might do. I hope I'd listen to my Bible, but if Job does, he's in trouble. I'm not talking literally about his Bible. I'm talking about what he thinks he knows about God. And a lot of times I equate what I know with what the Bible says. Do you ever do that? You know, the Bible's inspired, but my interpretation's not, neither is yours. And so what what Job had heard about God was right, what he thought about God was wrong. He thought God rewarded people right now. So he's got a civil war going in him. One day his wife comes out the gate. I think he says, oh boy, 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 this is going to be good. She loves me, I love her. She doesn't know any more about this than I do, but maybe she'll come, we'll just smile at each other and she'll pat me. Maybe she'll dare to touch me. She'll pat me and she'll hug me and things will be better. What does she do? What the devil would do were he there. She came out and said, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. I don't think she said it in that tone. I want to say it in that tone first. That's why I'd read it. Hadn't you read it sort of like that? I think she comes out and says, Honey, darling, are you still holding on to your integrity? Wouldn't it be better just to die? Wouldn't it be better just to curse God? Lightning will come and you'll be a crisp, but you, you'll be through with all this trouble. I think she just counseled suicide. I believe she would have been a believer in, what is it called, euthanasia or whatever that is, mercy killing. I think she just sang that. Job says, you talk like a woman never heard anything about God. That's what the word impious means. So you talk like an impious lady. You talk about a lot of ladies never heard anything about God. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall not we receive evil? How many of y'all fuss at God when you get more good than you deserve? What are you laughing about? Do you ever do that? Do you ever say, no, it's not right. I've got too much money. I've got too much food. I've got too much clothes. This isn't right. It's sinful for me. God's not righteous to give me all this. He said, honey, if you didn't complain, we had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she has and great household. If you didn't complain because God gave us more good than we deserve, but what right are you complaining because God gives us a little bit more bad than we think we deserve? Why don't you let God be God? Isn't that a good, isn't that a good reply? Are we, learning, are we learning the answer to the question, why the righteous suffer? Not at all. But are we learning the answer to the problem of suffering? Yeah, we are. I don't know how long it was, but one day he looked up and three camels, mules, chariots, some mean of conveyance was on the horizon. He looked and it was Elphaz and Bildad and Zophar, my three best friends, men of God, godly men, 
One of them was a professor of a Christian college, another director of school of preaching, and one of the most fabulous preacher in the brotherhood. I mean, he, these guys were men of God that had, had their head in the book for years, and had it screwed on right, and it helped and counseled and lifted people up. They're going to come, and surely, surely, they'll be able to speak some words of comfort to me. I don't have a right to say what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. My imagination rides along with those three guys as they come towards Job, and what they say later makes me kind of think they might have said this as they approached the city. And look at that ungodly guy on that ash heap. He must be some terrible sinner. Look at him. So far, the youngest had a little sharper eyes than the rest, and he said, that looks like Job. Job, come on, fellow, wake up. Be a little, be a little sensible. Job's a good man. He may be sick with some trouble. He couldn't be out here. Anybody with that much trouble is an ungodly. It is Job. And for, I got a right to say this in the book. For seven days and seven nights, they sit on the ground and they don't say a word. When I first read that, I said, hmm, that's good. Because when my dad died, those who comforted the most were those who said the least. Those who just came and sat, put their hand in mine, on mine, or walked. I got up and walked. They walked out with me, and we just walked about two miles down the road and two miles back. One guy, I remember one guy and I doing this. He never said a word. I never said a word. Every now and then he reached over and just touched my elbow or touched me on the shoulder. His name was Eddie Ellerman, my daddy's best friend. We got back to the house, Eddie just patted me on the arm, got in the car, and drove off. I've not said a word. He's not said a word, but I've been comforted. That's what I thought about this till I looked up in the concordance, seven days and seven nights saying nothing. And seven days and seven nights in the Bible saying nothing is the period for mourning the dead. The fourth day, it might have been good. The fifth day, it might have been good. The sixth day, it might have been good. At the end of the seventh day, they said, Job, we've come to mourn your death. That's why later he'll say, miserable comforters are you all. At the end of the first trial, Job didn't sin at all. At the end of the second trial, it said Job didn't sin with his lips. At the end of the third trial, Job sinned with his lips. Chapter 3 is a terrible chapter. Wish it. Sometimes I wish it were not there, but I'm sure glad it's there because it shows the depth to which a child of God can sink and still come back. Job curses. It's a rash speech. I call chapter 3 Job's rash speech. First of all, he asks the question, why was I born? The text says he cursed the day of his birth. He said, just remove that day from the calendar like it was today, June the 3rd. From now on, go June 2nd, June 4th. And don't have a June 3rd anymore. Just let that day perish and there be no June 3rds and everything that's ever happened on June the 3rd, let it no longer be in existence just so that I don't have to be here suffering out here on this ash heap listening to you fools. Listening to you miserable comforters. Then he said, secondly, why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't they just take me from the womb to the tomb? Why didn't they go announce to the, my mother is a boy, but he's still born, he's dead, and we've already buried him? And his third question is, why can't I die now? And that's the worst one. The first two are impossible. Why was I born? Why wasn't I born dead? Why can't I die now? He's not like Paul who wanted to die and go be with Christ. He just wanted to die to get rid of his troubles. His was a statement of unbelief. Paul's was a statement of belief. If I've got a lot of troubles about me and I say, I wish I could just die, I'm saying God doesn't know what he's doing. That's what that statement says. That's a statement of unbelief that doubts the ability of God to know the future and doubts the providence of God and doubts the love of God and doubts the power of God. So Job is now a doubter. Isn't it good to know a doubter can still be acceptable to God? Because Job's going to be acceptable to God through this whole thing. He doubts right now. But God knowing the future, just patting his foot and waiting. Because God knows the outcome of all this. I'm so glad God is God and not Job. I'm so glad that God is God and not you. I'm particularly glad that God is God and not me. I don't want to run for God. And I don't want to try to make any of God's judgments for God. Three friends speak, and that's our discussion tomorrow night. If you're wondering why we've taken so long on this first, this is all we're going to do with it. And from now on, everything I say is going to be repeated in the succeeding nights. Three, these three friends now speak. I give each one of them a nickname, and that's about all I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'll talk about what they said tomorrow night. Eliphaz is the exegete. 
Now, that's a, that's a preacher term. Uh, he's the Bible student. He's the Bible scholar. He's the fellow that if you give him a problem, he can quote a scripture. And a matter of fact, he's got some proof text just waiting for the problem to arise. I mean, he's, he's, got, he's had a vision, and he's got, that, he's got his whole world wrapped up in that one vision. He understands one passage well, and so he's going to make everything in the world bend to that one passage. I've been there, and I know some of you well enough know you've been there too. You know, we get an interpretation of one segment or one concept or one thought, and all of a sudden we start bending Scripture to make it agree with that one concept or one passage because we won't let this one grow or we won't let a chink, a chunk of it that was us, not God anyway, fall off so that God can supply something else. Eliphaz is the fellow who can quickly cite a proof text for any situation of life. We meet him in legalism today and many of the legalistic sects. Bill Dad, I call the historian, the traditionalist. He thought all wisdom was dead. He was the fellow that any time any problem came up, wanted to know what the fathers had said. It doesn't matter whether it's Catholic fathers or Church of Christ fathers. It really doesn't matter which group of fathers it is. He's the fellow who thought that if I want to know what's right about blank, I go read Brother Blank's book on that, and I find out what's right about that. We meet this fellow in the overzealous followers of Restorationalism and the Romanist. The third fellow is Zophar. He's the youngest, and I have trouble naming him, so I just call him the dogmatic rationalist. He was the humanist of his day in a way, but he was, a, he was not a secular humanist. He was a deistic humanist. He was the dogmatic rationalist who thought that his reasoning could supply any and all answers needed. And if he was alive today, he would start every answer with these words. Well, common sense says, you ever meet a fellow like that or a girl like that? You ever look at one in the mirror like that? They said, well, common sense says, you know the problem with common sense? It's neither common nor sensible most of the time. Brother Gus Nichols said one time we ought to talk about harsh sense. That's stable thinking. And so may... You know, but, but, th but even then, it would be the wrong appeal. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. So we have here the three ways that mo modern man normally approaches the problem of suffering, either with the misapplication of Scripture, the appeal to history, or the appeal to education. There's only one thing left, and that's a book like Mary Baker Eddy's book, and that would be a modern revelation, and we'll get that in Elihu, the sheer, the sheer sophomore, the young man that will speak after all the old men have spoken, and he will say, I've waited until now to talk because I thought old age ought to talk. But since y'all hadn't answered him, I will. One that is perfect in knowledge is with you, and so I'll speak. He was young at strike one, angry strike two, conceited strike three. He's out. <clears throat> but his appeal was the fact that God had spoken unto him in the night and whispered the answer in his ear. He had an additional or modern revelation. All of them believed in the theory of retribution, including Job. Everybody there. Now, I believe God is a God of retribution, but he just doesn't, just doesn't settle all of his accounts in October. I mean, God's going to settle his accounts at the end of this ball game, not in the middle of it. But the theory of retribution says that man is punished for his evil, rewarded for his righteousness, right now in agreement with to the degree of his righteousness or his unrighteousness. Now, Elihu will talk about Wednesday night. Elihu is the sure sophomore, the young man who doesn't say anything new and doesn't say anything that he says very well, but he does emphasize something the old men had just passed over and not, and not really stressed like they ought to. So he does give Job a chance to say, I'll just wait on God. Because that's the only thing you and I can do when we don't have the answer, right? When we've searched and we don't have the answer, what's the only righteous thing to do? W-A-I-T. Wait. And while you wait, shut up. While we're waiting, be quiet. Boom, 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 boom. A, a storm starts. I know where it starts. I'll just point over here. Storm starts over here and there's the lightning and there's the thunder and there's the heat lightning and all of a sudden that snake, that rope cloud starts coming out, that tornado. Cyclone. 
for a win. And here it comes. Boy, there goes, there goes Elihu. He's gone. Whew. Life as Bildad and Zophar get inside of a cave, you know, a storm shelter. Job gets down on his knees, holds up his hands, and faces the tornado. He'd been wanting to talk to God through this whole book. I'll talk about that Tuesday night, tomorrow night. He'd been wanting to talk to God. He said, God, where are you? I go to the right and you're not there. I go to the left and you're not there. I go forward and you're not there. I go back and you're not there. He forgot up. But he said, I'm running everywhere trying to find God. So I wish there was an umpire. Put one hand on God, one hand on Job. Said, God, meet Job. Job, meet God. Said, then I'd fill my mouth with argument. I'd argue. I'd say, you take, the, you take the affirmative, I'll negate. Or let me take the affirmative, you negate. He challenged God to a debate. So here comes God to debate. Job turned, ready to debate. God says, before we start, let me ask you a few questions. Just a short questionnaire. And, and then we'll have the debate. Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Uh, did you decide how big the world would be? If, if you don't believe God can be sarcastic, you hadn't read Job. Have you listened to the song of the morning stars? Excuse me, I didn't hear you. Did you establish the boundary of the sea? Can you make the morning come when you're ready? Excuse me. He, God does say sometimes. I didn't, I didn't hear what you said, Job. He said, have you ever walked on the ocean floor? Do you know where the light comes from? Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you control the lightning? Do you call for the stars when it's needed? Do you cause the stars to come out at night? Excuse me, I didn't hear you. What would you say? He said, well, if you can't do that, how about this? Can you feed the lion and the raven? Can you, do you know how the mountain goats breathe? That's the one out of the 17 we know today. Can you plow with the wild ox or the wild ass? Do you regulate the life of the ostrich? Do you give the war horse his great strength? Do the hawk and the eagle fly at your command? Now answer that. As soon as you get that filled in, pass and score, then we'll have ourselves a debate. You know what Job says? It won't go stick in your path, ain't it not? <laughs> The spoke, he said, no, he said, once I've spoken, yea, twice, I will not answer any more. He says, I lay my hand to my mouth. That's good, but it's not sufficient. When you challenge God to an argument, you either argue or shut up. I mean, excuse me, argue, repent, shut up is not good enough. So God says, okay, Job, if you can't take care of all that, just take care of the hippopotamus and the crocodile. He said, just go down to the water. I don't know if that's really what it is because the, the Hebrew is rather vague, but that'll do. Just get your rope about this long, go down to Florida, up there, there in the Everglades, and climb on top of an alligator, and just hook that thing in his snout, and just kick him in the deal, and ride him down the river. Do it once, remember it forever. <laughs> I mean, that, so he says, if you can control the hippopotamus and the crocodile, then I may turn this world over to you. When he gets through with that, Job says, I repent. He said, I've spoken words too great, like, you speak and I'll answer. I'll speak and you answer me. He said, I hate myself. I abhor myself and I repent in sackcloth and in ashes. And God said, good. And he turns to the three friends. He says, now you go take a sacrifice and offer it to me and get Job to pray for you. That's Job's last test. And theirs too. He says, you get Job to pray for me. I'll hear him. I won't hear you. They go off for sacrifice. They ask Job to pray for him. And Job, if he were me, probably would have said, what do you mean pray for you dudes? Where, you, where were you when I needed help? No, that's not me. That's Job. Now I know why God has no man like him. Job prayed for his friends. After he prayed for his friends, God gave him twice as much as he ever had before. 14,000 camels, 6, 14,000 sheep. 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses, many servants, seven new sons, and three new daughters. So beautiful, he called them little dove, flower, and beautifier. Not beauty, beautifier. When that lady entered the room, everything got beautiful. So Job died, lived 140 years after his trial, saw his sons and his sons' sons for four generations, died being old and full of glory. Started out... Once upon a time ended, happily ever after. A lot of trouble in between. What well, takes its place in the testimony of the ages, that there's a vacuum in the human heart that's cross-shaped, that only Jesus can fill. For he's really the only one that's going to be able to give me the power to do what Job did. The cry of man's anguish went up to God. Lord, take away pain the shadow that darkens the world thou hast made, the close calling chain that strangles the heart, the burdens that weigh on wings that would soar. Lord, take away pain. 
from the world thou hast made, that it love thee the more. Then answered the Lord to the cry of the world, Shall I take away pain, and with it the power of the soul to endure, made strong by the strain? Shall I take away pity that knits heart to heart and sacrifice high? Excuse me. Shall I take, uh, let me back up and quote that right, will you? Will you let me? Shall I take away pity that knits heart to heart and sacrifice high? Will you lose from your life all your heroes that live white, fire, white brows from the sky? Here's the verse I want you to hear. Shall I take away love that redeems at a price and smiles at your loss? Can you spare from your life that would cling unto mine the Christ and his cross? Drive a peg. We'll be back tomorrow night and take up right here.